April 2013. A crowd gathers in the lobby of the Barashu Museum in downtown Toronto. And not necessarily the typical museum crowd either. Then again, this is no typical museum. Yes, there are the usual wealthy patrons in suits and evening dresses. But so is a younger contingent, decked out in jeans and t-shirts and leather jackets. There's a DJ and there's a hip-hop dancer who drops down to the floor and spins around on his back, his feet extended high in the air. Founded in 1995, the Bada is the brainchild of Sonia Bada, a Swiss-born philanthropist whose family was a mainstay in the high-fashion shoe industry for more than a century. Her collection is world-class. Big-name designers and celebrity footwear. Elvis Presley's checkered loafers are here. So are one of the first pairs of stiletto heels. Tonight's exhibition, though, is a very different beast. Dubbed Out of the Box, The Rise of Sneaker Culture, the show follows the rise of the sneaker from humble athletic tool to a mainstay of the contemporary fashion world. Drinks in hand, the guests are directed past a line of glass cases that document shoe by shoe the sneaker's evolution. First, the tattered old 19th century track sneakers and the iconic Converse All-Stars from the early 1920s. Next, black and white Samba sneakers by Adi Dossler, the founder of Adidas, with their trademark three stripes. And nearby, competing suede kicks by Puma, the company run by Adi's estranged brother, Rudy Dossler. Soon, we're in the early 1970s, years when the young American company Nike first began to experience serious growth. And years when the modern sneaker wars really got started. In one of the glass cases sits a pair of Nike waffle racers, created by Nike co-founder Bill Bowerman and made famous by Steve Prefontaine. In another, the rounded-toe Nike Cortez, still considered one of the coolest sneakers ever made and the sneaker that brought Bowerman and his business partner Phil Knight to a new level of national fame. Then, a few rows over, the sneakers that put Nike on top. The Air Force One from 1982 in gleaming white and silver. And from 1985, the very first Air Jordan in bold red and black hues to match Michael Jordan's Chicago Bulls uniform. By placing the shoes in the kind of cases typically reserved for priceless sculptures, the designers and curators of Out of the Box are driving home a point. These shoes are beautiful. They are art. And they deserve to be treated that way. Out of the Box travels to Brooklyn, Oakland, and Atlanta, epicenters of American hip-hop and street culture. The show attracts a lot of sneakerheads, including young people who weren't even born when some of these shoes hit the court for the first time. And they know everything about these shoes. At every stop, the media glare is intense. There are glowing write-ups in fashion blogs, but also in the New York Times. National Public Radio sends a reporter to Brooklyn to cover the show. Camera crews line up outside the Oakland opening. The lines are long. Spectators come by the tens of thousands to wander through the collection and to take selfies in front of the most iconic sneakers ever created. Sneakers, one art critic writes, are obviously not just sneakers anymore. They're a chance for self-expression and a designer's playground to see just how far you can take rubber, polyurethane, and nylon. If there were ever any question as to the importance of the sneaker to contemporary fashion, it is not a question any longer. But while these sneakers are being appreciated as fine art, the two companies who made most of them are still going at it in the arena. And now, they're at each other's throats. If you're like me, by the time you finish lunch, you're already thinking about dinner. I'd love to cook more, but my problem tends to be finding the time to put together a list of things to shop for, and then you got to go to the supermarket with all the madness there. Hopefully, you've got enough energy to actually cook when you get home. Does any of this sound familiar? Well, that brings me to Plated. This is designed for food lovers like you and me. Plated offers 20 chef-designed recipes every single week. And they deliver everything that you need to cook in just the right portions right to your door. You know, 
I don't know about your family, but sometimes it's tough to get the kids to eat wholesome. When my seven-year-old daughter smelled the beef bolognese getting cooked up in the kitchen, she actually wanted to help with the cooking so we could get to the food faster. And she had such a great time with her mom using the simple step-by-step instructions. And on the night of lamb gyro, my son, who's strictly a burger guy, called it the best dinner in weeks. Man, the fries alone, they tasted like they were from a gourmet restaurant. And that's the difference that quality ingredients make. The portion sizes were perfect. You can't beat the convenience of delivery or the ease of preparation. They walk you through everything. For the Brown family, Plated has turned out to be solid gold. Discover your ideal dinner experience. Go to Plated.com slash BW to get 25% off your first four weeks for a limited time only. Terms apply. See Plated.com slash BW for details. That's Plated.com slash BW. From Wondery, this is Business Wars. I'm David Brown. When crowds line up to see sneakers that often cost as much or more than Gucci's, You know we've crossed some kind of cultural line. And to a remarkable extent, it's been the intense rivalry between the two companies we've been following that have gotten us here. After all, as the old business school saying goes, nothing drives innovation like competition. Which brings us to our final episode, The Defectors. The rivalry between Nike and Adidas has been intense for decades, but always respectful. That started to change in the 2010s as Adidas began to catch up with Nike in the U.S. Remember Kanye West's public ranting against Nike at Fashion Week? Increasingly, the gloves are coming off. Phil Knight was a former athlete, and he thought like one. You played for your team. You concentrated all your energy on dunking on your competitors. And he prized loyalty. You'll recall the raw rage that Knight directed at key executives like Rob Strasser, who left Nike for Adidas in the late 1980s, in what Knight later called an intolerable betrayal. So intolerable that Knight didn't show up to Strasser's funeral. So, in 2010, Nike decides to remind staffers of the importance of loyalty. Adidas is gaining on them, and they want their staffers to know they are being entrusted with vital trade secrets. The internal Nike campaign called Keep It Tight comprises a series of mandatory training modules, online videos, and black and white posters with the words, Protect the brand, yourself, the business. Every employee participates. Not every employee gets the message, however. In 2014, three Nike designers begin covertly discussing plans to leave Knight's company. All three men have the status of gods in sneakerhead circles. The Croatian-born Denis Dikovic joined Nike in 2015 and has recently become senior design director for soccer shoes. Mark Miner, the youngest of the group, heavily tattooed and perpetually dressed in a black V-neck t-shirt, specializes in cutting-edge running shoes. And Mark Dulcey has helped develop some of Nike's most iconic products, from the Air Force One to Kyrie Irving's signature shoe. Dikovic, Dulce, and Miner are ambitious and they are smart. And they are feeling a little stifled by the increasingly big brotherish atmosphere at Nike HQ and Nike initiatives like Keep It Tight. They have an idea. They'll pool their talent and start their own design studio, which they begin referring to in emails as the satellite, and they have an idea of who might fund just such a project. If you've listened to recent episodes, you know that Adidas, in recent years, has made a concerted effort to claw back American market share. The company has opened a big new office in Portland and has tapped a hotshot former Nike designer named Brian Foresta to head up its basketball division. It's working. Nike still has a sizable lead, but Adidas is chipping away at it every month. Dikovic, Dulce, and Miner like what they're seeing from the team at Adidas' headquarters in Portland. And they believe if they're given the reins, they can help take the operation to the next level. 
and they can provide it, as Dukovich assures his friends in email exchanges later included in a lawsuit filed by Nike against the designers. We're not presenting ourselves as three designers, but as the best team in the world. But if they want one of us and not the others, I won't go to Adidas without you. And neither will Miner. Much of what follows remains hotly disputed. It's the subject of lawsuits and countersuits between the shoe giants. But we know that in March of 2014, Dulce and Dikovich receive an email from Brian Foresta of Adidas. Hey guys, hoping we might be able to discuss careers. More emails follow, with Foresta, with Adidas Brass, with recruiters. Among themselves, the three designers stress that the Adidas studio will only be the first step for them. Dukovic is eager to be independent. Adidas's money will let us eventually be able to start our own business. Exactly. Of course, they don't say any of that to Adidas. And in August of 2014, Adidas offers the three of them jobs. Miner posts a photograph of Dulce, Dukovic, and himself to Instagram. The caption reads, Grateful for the past, excited for the future. Three brothers, three dreamers, three stripes. To Nike and its founder, Phil Knight, the designers have committed the ultimate sin. They've turned on their team. The company asks a forensic science firm to comb through the laptops and smartphones used by the three designers at Nike offices. The firm produces evidence that it says shows the men removed trade secrets from Nike headquarters. The designers flat out deny it. Dikovic will later say he's got no need for old design schemes. Things I knew about Nike's product development and design may already be stale and will certainly soon be ancient history. Besides, as a creative person, I thrive on innovation and freshness. If I thought Adidas wanted to hire me to implement Nike's ideas, I would never have accepted the job. In December, Nike files a $10 million lawsuit against Dukovic, Dulce, and Miner, alleging breach of contract, along with a host of other charges, including civil conspiracy. The designers file a countersuit, alleging a culture of intimidation at Nike. But no amount of legal wrangling is going to get them to go back to Nike. And by 2015, all parties have arrived at an out-of-court settlement. To this day, the terms are confidential. With a lawsuit behind them, the designers set up shop in an old warehouse in Brooklyn, a borough that has become synonymous with hipster and street culture cool. They fill the space floor to ceiling with inspiration, sketches, fabric squares, old Adidas advertisements from the company's European salad days. Dozens of additional designers are hired. The space gets a name, the farm, and a purpose. Disneyland for designers, as one executive puts it. It's a hotbed of creativity. It's a magnet for new talent. It's everything Nike once was, and a beacon for what Adidas can become. Hey, do me a favor. Stop and think about that idea you've had, the one you've been dreaming about the longest. Maybe it's that book you've always wanted to write or that blog you've been wanting to start. Well, guess what? A dream is just a great idea that doesn't have a website yet. Whether you're showcasing your work, selling products or services, or promoting your physical or online business, Squarespace makes it incredibly easy to design the website of your dreams. With Squarespace, You've got access to beautiful templates created by world-class designers and the ability to customize look and feel, settings, products, and more with just a few clicks. It's incredibly user-friendly. I've never had an easier time building a website. So you can keep dreaming or you can make it a reality with a website from Squarespace. Go to squarespace.com for a free trial. And if you'd like to support this show and you want to hear more shows like it, Then please, when you're ready to launch, use the offer code BW to save 10% on your first website or domain. That's squarespace.com, offer code BW. Think about the leaders of Nike and Adidas. They have something in common beyond shoes, I can guarantee you that, because people in powerful frontline positions are hungry for knowledge. They're reading and learning every chance they get. So think about how you spend your extra 15 minutes. 
You go online to Facebook or maybe browse for something you don't need. Here's where our friends at Blinkist come in. They can take that little bit of extra time you might have and make it time well spent. Take a book like What They Don't Teach You at Harvard Business School by Mark McCormick. What if you could download the essential lessons of that book by listening to the key insights in just 15 minutes? Now you can, and Blinkist makes it possible. Right now, Blinkist has a special offer just for Business Wars listeners. Go to Blinkist.com slash BW right now to start your free trial or get three months off your yearly plan when you join today. That's Blinkist, spelled B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T, Blinkist.com slash BW to start your free trial or get three months off your yearly plan. Blinkist.com slash BW. New Year's Eve, 2015. Kanye West, the biggest rapper in the world, has just dropped a new single, as he often does on the last day of the year. In 2014, it was just one single, an ode to his infant daughter. This year, it's Facts, an ode to his sneakers. More specifically, it's an ode to his sneaker line for Adidas, called Yeezy. Kanye debuted it just a few months earlier after leaving Nike for the Three Stripes. The Yeezys have been tremendously successful. Stores can't keep them in stock, and the media hype around the shoes is as big as anything that ever greeted the launch of a Nike shoe. And now, in fact, Kanye is taking a victory lap. He's rubbing it in. Then comes the infectious hook. Just jumped over Jumpman. He's talking about Michael Jordan. Is there some hyperbole in there? Of course there is. Nike has hardly resorted to giving sneakers away. Between the main Nike brand and the Jordan brand, it still owns about 46% of the sneaker market in the U.S. But Adidas is making all the right moves, and the Yeezys are only part of it. There's the farm, the design shop out in Brooklyn. There's Adidas president of American operations, Mark King who has poured money into advertising and gobbled up new endorsees, including the basketball star James Harden, who recently signed a deal worth an estimated $200 million over 13 years. There are the forays into pop culture partnerships, polka dot Adidas sneakers and lime green track jackets from the singer and producer Pharrell, the goat leather kicks by acclaimed goth designer Rick Owens, and there's the freedom granted to designer Brian Foresta, the guy who helped land the three Nike defectors. Foresta is targeting the type of high-tech basketball footwear that Nike sees as its bread and butter. Shoes like the sleek, crazy light boost, a sneaker that debuts at NBA All-Star Weekend in front of a TV audience of millions. Foresta tells GQ the future belongs to Adidas. I have all the respect in the world for a competitor like Nike. They don't intimidate us in any manner because they're heavy, they're big, they're oversaturated in the market, and I think people are looking for a change. Soon, the numbers might prove them right. In 2016, for the first time in as long as pretty much anyone can remember, the most popular sneaker in the United States is not a Nike shoe. It's the Superstar, the classic sneaker by Adidas. That same year, Adidas sees a modest spike in overall American sales, bringing it to around 6% of the U.S. market compared to around 45% for Nike and its subsidiary, the Air Jordan brand. But in 2017, the gains are much more pronounced, as the three stripes almost doubles its market share to around 11%. Impressive, but hardly a lethal threat to Nike. The swoosh still has a healthy market lead and plenty of tricks up its sleeve. It's coming out with cutting-edge shoes, too, and is expanding from the baseball courts to fashion runways. What is really amazing is how far both Nike and Adidas have gone in this seemingly endless foot race. In being fierce and fearless competitors for nearly half a century, they have put so much distance between where they are now and their own humble origins. They're both making better shoes, and they have made each other better companies, too. Today, roughly half a century after the founding of Blue Ribbon Sports, the predecessor to Nike, and nearly a century since the Dassler brothers founded their company, the sneaker wars 
are entering a new era. Not that all the old generals have left the battlefield. In November of 2017, 16 of the best college basketball teams in the country converge on Portland for the Phil Knight Invitational, a tournament convened to celebrate the Nike founder's 80th birthday. With Knight in the audience, the teams fight their way through two eight-team brackets. It's top-notch basketball, fast and furious. And it's a fitting homage to Knight, who about a year earlier had made good on his promise to step down from Nike's board, handing over the title of chairman to Nike CEO Mark Parker. This tournament is a kind of farewell, as well as a birthday celebration. He gets a cake with his face painted on it with frosting. In one of the final games, a championship face-off between Michigan State and UNC, Knight makes an appearance courtside. We have a very special guest joining Bill Knight, joining us here courtside. He, of course, is the co-founder and chairman of Nike. Knight is the last survivor of the original feud with Adi Dossler's Adidas. He is dressed in a black shirt and black blazer. He pulls a pair of headphones over his head and settles in between a pair of ESPN announcers for a brief interview. He talks about the early days of Nike, about how he'd always been a runner, though now he runs so slowly that he confesses it's a bit more like a walk. But he does that 12 miles a day while he listens to books. He reminisces about Michael Jordan, the former UNC player whose shoes made Nike millions and millions of dollars, about proposing his business to a doubtful father and a supportive mother, one of the sports commentators asks what advice he'd give the next generation of entrepreneurs. The kids today are smarter than ever before, and they're kind of afraid to fail. My advice is just don't be afraid to fail. And it's almost like he's talking to the young man he was in 1964 when he began this journey. As Knight knows, this is no sprint. This is a marathon. And even if he's no longer running in it, it's not over yet. Not by a long shot. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Business Wars. Before we leave Nike versus Adidas and the start of our next business war, I'll be talking next episode with two veterans who were there during the heat of the sneaker wars. So make sure you check out our special interview episode next that'll wrap up our story of Nike versus Adidas. Subscribe right now on Apple Podcasts, TuneIn, NPR, Spotify, Wondery.com, or wherever you're listening to this show right now. You'll find a link on the episode notes. Just tap or swipe over the cover art. You'll also see some offers from our sponsors. Please make sure to support our show by supporting them, won't you? If you like what you're hearing, we'd love for you to give us a five-star rating and tell your friends how to subscribe, too. Another way to support us is to answer a short survey at Wondery.com slash survey. Tell us what business war stories you'd like to hear. I'm your host, David Brown. Matthew Shear wrote this story. Karen Lowe is our senior producer and editor. Sound designed by Bay Area Sound. The executive producer is Marshall Louie. Hernan Lopez is the creator of Business Wars. Business Wars.